you were in China, you were very clearly, in a way, the conscience of China, you know, advocating for human rights. And now you're um, in Europe, you're living in Berlin, and in a funny way, that role has been transported into Europe, and you're becoming, through this film, the conscience of Europe. And I was just wondering how comfortable you are in this role as an outsider. I always believed uh, these very basic values of a human dignity are related. It could be a totalitarian society, but also could be an uh, established uh, uh, so-called democratic society or society with much freedom. So with this kind of globalization um, condition, and uh, to retalk to talk about or to defend very essential values uh, is, a, is a learning and a new task. But you're in Europe, which of course is in some ways the epitome, I mean, has for many, many years uh, argued for human rights. When I mean, you go back to the Greeks, and uh, there's a long, long tradition of democracy, respect for the individual right through the French Revolution, etc., etc. So you're at the, the, the heart of this right now. Uh, and European values have been extended around the world. But Europe is being tested, to my mind, in a significant way. How do you think it's uh, uh, reacting to this test? I think this uh, very profound uh, uh, test. And uh, so far, European response to it is quite, uh, personally, I feel it's quite disappointing. Uh, not just by not provide a safe passage or to let those people settle, even just momentarily to have a safe shelter, but rather to be treated its very essential values, which Europeans have been uh, put so much sacrifice in defending for uh, for hundreds of years to come up to this as uh, a foundation of our modern society, but simply to twist and to defend, uh, to 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 betray those values, I think it's tragic to say, and uh, I think not to meet its own promise and uh, to really make an effort uh, in this modern way to come up with some new vision and understanding of humanity. It shows the society has been weakened and uh, it shows a lost courage and a loss self-confidence in many ways. So after the Second World War, Europe confronted another massive refugee crisis. I mean, millions of people were displaced and it managed to deal with that crisis. Are you optimistic, Ai Weiwei, in terms of how Europe might well in the future, even though it stumbled a little bit? Are you optimistic about how Europe might deal with this, this issue? I have all the reasons not to be optimistic, but I do feel uh, optimistic because if you see human development, it's, it's always have to meet the struggles. And that struggle has to always um, uh, takes a lot of a lot of uh, individuals to be to be be con conscious to act up, uh, because all those human conditions are defined by ourselves. You know, we are part of it. So there's no way uh, we can avoid a personal involvement. That's why I I jumped into this topic and. Uh, and trying to make my personal journey and understanding the situation. I think there will be more people who identify with this kind of effort. And uh, if a society has this kind of conscious, I believe human has this kind of uh, strong uh, inner need to protect the justice and the fairness. And those are not just for our own survival, it's not just for those refugees, but for our future, our children, to, to, to live in a much safer world. When I was there, I went to Itamini and volunteered for two weeks. And what, um, I mean, I'm in my 60s like you. And I guess what impressed me the most were the other volunteers were all in their 20s. It felt a little bit like that generation was taking ownership of this issue. They came from all over Europe, and they were all under 30. And that really impressed me. That gave me a sense of, of collective hope. 
um, that people could care about this issue. Yeah, one of the phenomena about uh, this refugee um, crisis, very often we just talk about it, is, is human crisis. Then we see uh, NGOs and, uh, and uh, those uh, volunteers uh, come from everywhere. They are very impressive. They have a knowledge. They know how to organize uh, sense to to risk people, and they they really do it uh, with most generous way, and uh, that shows a very different landscape. It struck me um, as I think about this crisis, this 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 issue, that you have two strands, two developments going on in the world. One is uh, globalization, obviously and uh, the breaking down of barriers um, and then at the same time uh, and it's massive globalization right now and at the same time of course you've got uh, an increasing amount of, of feelings towards a nationalism of people retreating behind their borders so on, uh, on the one hand you have borders being destroyed and on the other hand you have borders being erected do you think this is just a transitionary moment in human history or do you think that this is leading towards something a little bit more fundamental? I think it's obvious, as you point out, the, there's like two sides of our coin. One side is globalization, which already break all the uh, boundaries and borders in, in, in this kind of political, economical map. But another is the, the fundamentalist, the rightist, to build uh, physical borders among the you know, the, on, on the map. So these both are still working uh, in very different directions. One's um, driving by profit or the grab of the opportunity of a globalization and uh, already showed a tremendous change in the world. And another is uh, a strong notion to build over 70 fences to stop the flow of the very bottom of the people in the physical condition and which very often those people are casualties of globalization. If you look at this way, you can see it uh, give more clear answer about uh, what happens in the world today. At the same time, apart from globalization and the issues of those economic issues and some of the political issues, some of the strife that's happened in countries like Iraq and Syria, and um, Palestine, you have the, the, the equally large challenge of uh, climate change, which in my mind is driving the refugee crisis as much as some of the political crises. Um, what can we, again, when you look into the future, and it's a very diff difficult question, what do you see in that future? Um, do you see an increasing, the refugee problem increasing as uh, climate warming forces people to migrate? I think the, the, the map of our future is p uh, pretty clear and uh, with a very strong uh, exploration of the, the world power, you know, the economic power or political power. They are taking a great advantage uh, globally, but sometimes lacking of uh, responsibility, lacking of leadership, vision, and, uh, and uh, a really uh, clear global um, tactics in treating all those potential problems. And uh, on the other side, as you said, uh, we have uh, environmental problems. Uh, the ecosystem has been very fragile, and uh, the famine, the education, and the, the, the population growth. And, uh, and also a lot of, lot of regional uh, instability uh, still pushing and uh, causing a great deal of uh, refugees and the human flow. To solve this problem, it takes the world level of consciousness not to divide the world just like privileged one and also those unfortunate ones, but to see human condition as one. If we destroy that balance and uh, the the, the tragedy is inevitable, and uh, in every aspect, especially the, the, the environmental problem, can cause a much bigger uh, problems in the future. We already see signs, the, the weather change, you know, we see the flooding, we see the hurricane, you know, we see all kinds of signs. If those things happen in more dense uh, reason, and uh, you know, even for the developed nations, uh, it's very hard to 
uh, to cope with. And uh, so it, it takes individuals to have a voice to push the political leaders or to, to, to set up a global warning system to deal with this problem. I was at the Q&A for your film a couple of nights ago and you talked about the fact that you were trying to show this film to leaders of the world or to even include them in your film but they were not interested in, in appearing on camera. I think that was the sense I got or maybe you could just talk about the failure of leadership globally and what we can how as individuals, I guess, when there is that failure of leadership, how do we react to that? Yes, to, to make an artwork or to make a film always has this challenge. You know, it's not an easy way to, 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 to even to make people conscious or to, to, to be convincing. But the, the effort is always there. It's many people like me or, or people working in the film industry or in the very different art industry. Uh, I have a clear understanding about why we have to work this way and why we have to get the message a across. And we are dealing not just to have film showing in the theaters, but to show the leadership. We already showed the, in US Congress uh, to some congressmen. Uh, it's very positive, people's response from high level or lower level. And uh, you know they they all think this is a very critical issue, and they need to be uh, be more aware about. One of the things that really impresses me about this film, as well as your work in general, is the scale of the work. It's very large scale. I mean, I saw these sunflower seeds at Tate Modern um, in London. I've seen many of your other exhibitions, and of course, this film you shot it in multiple countries around the world. It's not an intimate portrait. It really tries to get that sense of scale. Maybe you could talk about the difference between scale and intimacy. Yeah, we, when I grew up in this society, which is communist, we always think we have to have a world perspective. Ironically, you know, Chairman Mao always teaches us, you know, you are the future. You have to have a world point of view or global view. So what he's talking about is rather about the third world countries in defending, you know, uh, their own rights and uh, also to to destroy so-called uh, imperialism or capitalism. But China become capitalism or or how do you call the communist type of capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, state capitalism. And uh, but uh, I I still think uh, one maybe one education uh, in my use is still uh, 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 valid is uh, to have a global view about uh, uh, human condition, and uh, that's why we many of my works are in dealing with members which have the details the sensitivity of an individual element, but at the same time to have a much collected uh, numbers and such as a hundred million of sunflower seeds or or we did a strong earthquake research, you know, find the thousands of students the so name and birthday and uh, you know those kind of investigations mm -hmm. and now we are doing refugee uh, films but by doing that, we do researches about in the history, the literature, the poetry, the, the important artistic uh, practice in dealing with the human flow, the same topic. And uh, for me, it's such a, a rich um, uh, practice. It's not just trying to make a cinema film, but rather uh, understanding the profoundness of the humans eager to move to another place and uh, to give up everything as the most brave uh, creature on the planet to have, still have a vision after they give up everything still can build uh, a new life this is very profound if you see all those migrants come to canada or united states they basically it's all from ground zero ground zero you know it's from the tragic they have to leave and they all uh, made some achievement not just to their own family but to the society 
Um, what struck me about the film is both the scale but also the intimacy. I mean, I think these two things, there's some very intimate moments in the film. Uh, one, I, the one I remember very strongly is the woman with her back to the camera, who's obviously in distress. You're in the shot as well. And then, of course, you have these drone shots. And the drone shots add a dimension that maybe one couldn't have even added to a documentary 10 years ago because the drone was not used. You, you were above the camps. You got the sense of the anonymity of it all. But I like the tension between intimacy and anonymity. And maybe, I don't know if that provokes any thoughts uh, our way away. I think you, you made a very clear, um, um, how do you say, the structure of the film. And, uh, you know, you, you, it's uh, how we cope with this very large uh, global condition with very different historical aspect or different argument. And to who is bare all those uh, casualties, who is victimized, you know, the individuals, the, the, the mom or the children, a cat or a tiger or a cow or, you know, all those uh, very, very essential uh, dailyhood feelings we all connect to. So these two are is the most essential element to put this film together and to, to, to narrate some kind of story or human feelings to make um, people still can to connect to. Mm -hmm. When I grew up in the 60s, there were so many artists making political statements. It was a moment, of course. Um, how fashionable is it, how easy is it to be an artist who's also involved in not politics, but politics in the general sense of the word in 2017? I think it's uh, it's better than ten years ago. Maybe my effort contributed a lot, but to call artist uh, activist is never a nice name. Or you know, it always I think most artists would not be preferred to to have that title. You know, art has been seen as for art's sake for quite a long time. There's a lot, a lot of. Uh, um, you know, this has become some kind of aesthetic uh, battle. And for me also, you know, I, I always defend uh, the artist have, should have a perfect position, not only in redefining the aesthetics, but also moral and the philosophical condition. So it's easier today, but it's not uh, accepted. You know, in many ways, people would use that words to say, okay, that is not art, you know, because it's talked about a real life. Do you feel that you've been pushed into this role, or do you feel that this is a role that you've, you're completely comfortable with? Would you like to be just a pure artist, or is, or is this something that you just can't, can't resist? I think my role as an artist is to to really define what art is about. You know, each generation, the artists would give very different answer about what art is about. And I try to honestly face in my life and my time. And uh, my contribution can be small or large, but this effort to connect art to ordinary people's feeling and to what is relevant in our time is always there in each generation, from from uh, medieval to Renaissance to contemporary practice. You know, if you see some artists, it's relevant that it's always in some way in define the new conditions of art. Have your provocations, the success of your provocations, surprised you? I wouldn't say it's so su successful. It made my name, uh, maybe uh, people can recognize, but to see its success, I will continue to face how many people go to the theater. You know, that's a very clear count, you know, how many people would go to the theater to see the film, right. you know, how many people would be convinced. This is very clear, you know, it's by ticket. You know, if you be artist in a, in a museum, it takes one collector who, who can collect all your life's work. It's easy, it's just one person being convinced. But to put a film in, a theater, uh, in the system, 
in the theater is very democratic. It tests your ability, also challenges our real life. You know, each audience, do they care or do they think it's important? Are you traveling with the film a lot then and doing a lot of Q and A's to the screenings like you did here? This is probably that almost 200 interviews that have been done for this right. film before this film mm. really uh, sees the audience. I will do the maximum possibilities. I will have another 20 cities to go and will, each city will go to maybe 10 to 20 very extensive and person-to-person -person interview in most powerful media. So I, I, I'm so pleased I have a chance to talk to you. Is this just in North America or this is all over the world? It's globally. It's uh, global. This film was fortunate before we, we even really had to uh, present the full film. The global rights has been sold in theaters, except China and North Korea. When you were in the camps, did, how intrusive did you feel as a, as a person and as a, as a filmmaker? Um, I felt intrusive. I felt like I was a tourist when I was there. And you, probably, you spent much more time there than I did. I was only there for two weeks. This is a, a strange relationship to work out, isn't it, between? In one hand, I'm lucky I grew up in very difficult uh, uh, circumstance. So I feel this kind of familiarness to, to have the very essential um, possibility to survive. But of course, you have always struggled with, you're the one temporarily there and you're just taking some images, then you leave. You don't really care because you cannot really offer direct help to each individual. They all need something very, very essential. Mm -hmm. So this struggle is always there and this struggle will remain in my life because uh, you know, you, you do feel somehow you always betray them because you you cannot really uh, offer more, more help, help. So then the, the kind of way you're offering is uh, through film or through art. And uh, yeah, that has to be tested. Yeah, when I was there, of course, they basically wanted their story to be told. It was take our yeah. story out to the world. That's um, true. Don't help me individually. It's more just tell our story to the West. Yeah, Make those people, as so you, you know it, because you have been there, they, they are they're the people with dignity. They're not beggars, you know, they're very proud people. And uh, they're just waiting there to see if this, this sunshine of humanity can really um, to, to, to be in their camp or, you know, there's someone who will say, okay, you are accepted, we understand you. What is the future? next step for you? I don't know. I don't know. I have future. <laughs> I, I, uh, I always work uh, with uh, intuition and uh, I don't have much plan. I go with the flow and uh, you know we have problems, we treat the problem. You know I, I, I often joking I'm like a, a superintendent in a large building. People will call me in the midnight and say here is leaking please just come up. I will go up to fix the you know, plumbing or something, then another phone rings, you know, I just running from here to there. Thank you very much, Ai Weiwei, for being here and sharing some of your thoughts about the world, the refugee crisis, and your new film, Human Flow. Thank you so much. Thank you.